basically a gentleman named Pythagoras, <laughs> as in Pythagorean's theorem, um, thought he would study music and try to figure out how to make harmonious music. And so I think he made a big mono string. And so just a big long board and attached a big long string to the two ends of it, started plucking it, and then pressing it at different places along the board and plucking and seeing which intervals between the two plucks sounded the uh, nicest number line. You're calling this zero and one. If you sort of put your fingers over on zero, in other words, not placing your fingers, one of the conditions that we started with here was imagine that the two strings had the same tension and so the same tone, that they were matched strings. Well, not putting it certainly should be a case, which Maybe I'll put it over here at one for not uh, matching it and put this on the fingerboard and call that one and uh, this is all the way, full length. So that's another place that we can have. So, so far we've got a length of one, a length of one half. Can we get another place where you would get a nice tone? In fact, now here there's something mathematical that you can do. Because you've got a one. A four? A four, yeah, why not? Because if a half gives you something nice, half the length, then half of the half is a four. So this kind of implies that you're going to get a one-fourth position. Somehow a fourth isn't quite as new as a half. What we said is that um, a half was an octave. Doing a half and a half is going up two octaves. Certainly doing two octaves together is something that's going to sound reasonable and will sound nice is something that we can do. Is there another point where you might stick your finger? Which you can be doing experiments. Try to find it on your stringed instrument and mark out and measure where it is comparing the distance. So see if you can find something different. You maybe play a half, play a fourth, and then try to find something that's not a half, but a fourth. Yeah, it's like there's two different ways. There's the way when you have three quarters left and one quarter. Yeah, there also seems to be a spot at some about two thirds. Can we find something else? Something like two oh, yeah. thirds. Two thirds. Sure. From the zero to the end. Somehow there's a symmetry there, right? Whether I put it two-thirds, I'd have a two-thirds in one part and a one-third in the other. The difference between two-thirds and one-third is an octave. I kind of like that, so let's put a one-third here. And we can't build a one-third out of just taking halves and halves of halves. So that's actually something new. That's kind of an interesting sound. You might be able to come up with a one sixth. Ah, which a one sixth, as soon as you have a half and a third, you've automatically got a one sixth right. because you can first do the one third and then you can do half of that going an octave above it. And octaves always sound nice, is one of our axioms. And so those two things together imply one sixth. And so we've got. One, one over one, one half, one third, one fourth, one sixth. Um, and of course, we're going to get all products of those as we go through, because we could have one eighteenth by taking a third of the one sixth. Is there anything else that might sound nice? Well, Let's talk a little bit about the physics of what's happening here. We've got some string that's going to be vibrating, and the ends of the string are tied here and here. And so then the way you describe that is it might be doing something, I guess I should be using the blue the string, is, yeah, it could be going it could have some blob of a position, and then this could go down, this could go up, this could go down, and it just sort of oscillates back and forth as it does that. You'd like 
to kind of see what are the simplest kind of vibrations. As the string vibrates, it knocks into air molecules and eventually knocks into ear drum. And you can read about how the ear works, which is a nice story. Um, but here I've got a string and roughly I can wave it around <coughs> so that this end will roughly be fixed and this end will roughly be fixed. It's not quite, but I can get some different motions. I can get, so you see that kind of looks like the top where my hand is holding it and the top and the bottom where it's got a little bit of weight at the end is holding it. And so this looks like a wave that kind of does this. This is the full string. This is what we, I call a first mode of vibration. And you know, this thing is just going up and down. So this has one here. Um, one thing that we could talk about here is we could talk about the wavelength that you happen to see here. And so this might have one unit of wavelength, well, going from here to here, where the wavelength would be double the length of the string. If I was going to model this, what kind of function might I use to model this? Sine. I use a sine and I could pick the sine wave so that this was scaled to be zero and this would be scaled to be pi. Is that the only kind of wave that I could stick on this string where the string is held fixed at these two points? Look at the places with the numbers that you see here. Well, if I did a cosine, a cosine wave, you might draw something like this, right? And it would be a half period, so that's and not I nearly enough. This. The, I mean, it's like a negative cosine the, wave is what you... The problem with the cosine is this point would be going this way, this right. way. It wouldn't be attached to the string, right? It would be broken. That would be an open-ended instrument. You know, that might model the end of a recorder if somebody stepping this way in a recorder. Um, but, so, with a string, with it being fixed, can you draw another wave where it's going to be zero here and zero here? Well, if you're holding down in the middle, you're just shortening the period, right? Ah. So with the sine, what, if the first one was sine x, you'd have sine 2x, and ah. so the halfway point. So then this could look like sine x, then we could have a sine 2x, and here you notice it's got a zero at the halfway point, and this particular sine wave is also a zero here, and here, this I can denote has, if I'm looking at the wavelength, um, the wavelength here is one times lambda naught, the fundamental wavelength for the wave. In this case, the wavelength is one half times lambda naught. Which you know, why don't you define lambda naught? Because I'm not sure we don't uh, know what that is. Lambda naught is the distance from here, you know, over to here. That's mm -hmm. because if I make a full sign out of this thing. That's one period, the length of one period of the sign. And then when I look here, the distance here is half of the distance coming across here. So that's half of lambda naught, which I suppose I should make this a little lower if I'm making a table. Which, this is going to be the second mode. Which, I bet I can do a second mode. It gets harder and harder to do higher modes, but let's see. I might have to. Am I getting a point in the middle? Oh, can you lift it up a little bit higher? Sure. Maybe I'll stand on a chair and try it. Extreme math. <laughs> so, let's see if I can. 
No, I really have it. So it yeah, looks it mm -hmm. for a yeah. little bit. <laughs> yeah, so it had a. Yeah, so I mean, but it gets one position where it's doing one mode of vibration. That's pretty easy. Yeah, that's good. So it has a fixed point here and a fixed point there. Right. Now I have to go probably twice as fast. Ah, this rope is just a little bit kinky. But if I get this, if I had a more silky rope, I maybe should have done this with cotton rope. But um, you can see that the rope could make two humps if I could do this, right? Mm -hmm. And certainly you can imagine the string vibrating like this repeatedly. In fact, when you put your finger at the one-third point, what do you think the waveform picture would look like? And would have to, yeah. This thing, instead of being at the one half point, would be at the one third point. You'd get something where it have a little bump, a bump, and a bump like that. And this would be a sine three x. This would have a length that would be would take three of them to fill out the whole lambda knot. So this would have a wavelength one third lambda knot. Um, this would be the third vibrational load. And then, of course, we've got a fourth already. A one-fourth lambda knot, sine 4x, and then it's going to cut here. Oh, up oh, here, 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 here. So it's going to go up, down, up, down. There's just two octaves. What do you suppose the next thing in the series would be if we're just trying to get waves so that they're pinned at the ends? Sine 6x. Oh, 5. Oh. How about oh. sine 5x? Oh. Would sine 5x would be kind of... It will would be, it be like an odd one. one. Actually, yes. Okay. That's a good experiment to do. Um, this would be a sine 5x, a one-fifth lambda knot. And yeah, this is fourth mode, fifth mode. Let's, and so in fact, the series that you're going to get is a half, third, fourth, a fifth. I've got a red pen, a sixth. In fact, you might recognize the terms in this sequence. This sequence going one, one half, one third. One fourth, one fifth, one sixth. It's called the harmonic sequence. Have you ever heard that in one of your math classes? Mm -hmm. The reason it's called the harmonic sequence is exactly these musical harmonies that you're hearing. In fact, you'll notice I tied some bob on the end of this. The reason I tied a bob on the end of this is there's another way to see how you can relate these things together. Maybe let's put in another coordinate besides um, wavelength to measure things. Um, let's measure things with frequency, and let's just analyze the units. So frequency is the number of cycles this is going to make per second. So we have frequency. And the unit, which is denoted by the letter nu, and this means the units of nu is cycles per second. We've got wavelength, lambda, and its units are just going to be, say, meters, and this might be in meters, kilograms, second MKS system. Um, so if we combine these two things together, um, Actually, this is meters per cycle. Right? 
have to say what the distance is. And so it's how long one particular cycle is. So one way I could combine these together when I see the cycle and the cycle here is it's a natural thing to do. Multiply and cancel. Multiply it. Sure. So if I take the frequency times the wavelength, the units of that are going to be cycles per second times meters per second, oops, times meters per cycle. This cancels off with that. This analysis of units is remarkably powerful. I could do a whole lecture on this. But what kind of thing do you measure in meters per second? This is a velocity, so this is some velocity. This is V is the wave velocity. Which basically depends on the speed of sound. This is kind of a fixed thing, and so this gives you an inverse relationship between these two things. And so if you want to know what happens to the frequency, the frequency, if you divide the wavelength by three, what happens to the frequency? So look at this relation. This is a constant. So if I am going to try to keep these products the same. So if I make this one third as big, then this one is going to be three times larger because I need three times the one third to keep it constant. So the frequency goes up by a factor of three when we do that. And so um, now let's actually take a look and I can make some of these tunes with something slightly more sophisticated than the computer. Oh, let me do one more oh, physical demonstration. And so another physical demonstration, this works much better on a swing set. But imagine that we've got a swing set and I'm pushing my daughter on the swings. You know, yay, she wants me to keep pushing and pushing. So I can give a frequency where I push you know, once every 10 seconds, for instance, and so six cycles per minute. Like a pendulum? Instance. Yeah, it's just exactly a pendulum and I'm pushing it. Well, after four hours of this, uh, <laughs> she's very happy, I start getting tired. And so what I might start doing is push, swing, swing, push, swing, swing, push, swing, swing. I can take this thing and I can keep pushing it, but instead of pushing it every time she comes back, I can push it every second time she comes back. And in fact, that will keep her moving. Um, not only could I push it her every second time she comes back, I could also push her every third time, third time she comes back, or every fourth, fourth time. time, or every fifth Time. Again, there's the sequence of pushing her, where I'm multiplying the frequency by one, two, three, four, by a natural number, which has the effect of taking the wavelength and multiplying it by a fraction like this. And those all fit together very nicely. The motion of the swing stays fairly consistent. The motion of the string, when you have a real string or a real instrument and you play it, the waveform that you get certainly it has to be a waveform that's going to be fixed at these two ends, so it's going to be equal to zero. But you'll find that your waveform is going to be a sum of a bunch of waves that you see like this, where it'll be this wave with a particular amplitude plus this wave with a particular amplitude. And the ratios of those amplitudes give you the characteristic of the instrument for a different collection of those. You might be listening to a piano chord, uh, piano key being hit, or you might be listening to a guitar string being plugged or a violin string being bowed. Those are called the harmonics. The lowest one that you see is the fundamental frequency. Um, but then you can still combine together. So the sound of the instrument automatically has these pieces as components in it. Since it has these in it, adding more or less is changing the form a little bit. But I'm not going to be able to stand here. 
Let's see if I can start this thing up. So. There's a remote too, if you if you need to turn it on. Look at this. It looks like it fits. Yeah. The uh, percent signs are just comments. And so then this thing with a T is just means that we're making a, an array, a collection of numbers going from 0 to 8 in steps of 1 over 8,192. And why that? Why that number there? Um, that is probably a power of 2. In fact, let's uh, guess. What happens if we take two to the tenth as a thousand? And so this, is, I need three more. So what happens when we take two to the thirteenth power and compute it? So this is a big calculator. So that's eight thousand one hundred ninety-two. So basically, this thing is binary, and so we want to cut things up into brackets of two. And so we're taking, say, an eight-second interval, and we're looking in little chunks of time. So that will put eight thousand one hundred ninety-two subsamples per second. So we'd have that times eight samples, and we're just going to graph a function here. And when we graph the function, let's look back at what the program is doing. Um, we, uh, the function we're going to graph is sine of 2 pi times 440 times t. And so this is giving you the frequency when I stick this number here. And this is going to do two things. It's going to export this function to the speakers that you see here. And it's going to graph it so that we'll be able to both see it and hear it. So let's see if this actually works. And so this is a tone. And let's put in a semicolon and hit enter. So this is the standard tone that musicians use to tune their instruments. This is the standard. So now we can do things to this, like we can go up an octave. Um, I'm tempted to just change this and put in an octave here. Um, so go up an octave, what would you do to the frequency? Make it twice as fast. You'd make it twice as fast, so instead of 440, we'd use 880. And, oops, I got an extra zero. So I'll save that and come over here and hit it again. That's also an A, which this one sounds the same as the other one. That might get a little annoying. I mean, you should have let, met eight, less than eight <laughs> seconds. Um, so when tones sound higher, they're really just going faster? Yes. Cool. And so. Now let's do something where let's put a couple tones together. And so this still sounds like a machine. It doesn't sound like a piano or a string, but we could make uh, something that sounded more like a piano or a string instrument if we combine several harmonics together. So let's first, I want to open up the file here that's called one fifth, um, which We'll, have to, we'll see why it's called one-fifth in a second, but if you're going to look, you remember our string where we said that notes and then you go octaves, basically we want to call those the same thing. So we're going to call everything when you multiply by two, up, 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 the same note. Uh, it's just in a different octave. Um, so that gets us a half, a fourth. What was the next fraction that we saw after we did a half, a fourth, an eighth, a sixteenth? Third, the fifth third, took us a little while. In fact, you were the one who found a one-third. And so, in terms of the frequency, we could multiply the frequency by three. Well, if you want to put that back in the same octave range, we can multiply and divide by twos as much as we like. So we might multiply by three and, and divide by two to drop it down in octave. And that will give us another note. Um, and so, over here, there should be a file that's called the 
fifth. Here it is. Let's open it up um, in Notepad so you can see my program. So this one, the thing to key in on is the formula that I'm <coughs> highlighting across here. And so I took and cut the amplitude in half on both waves. And so I've got our original A note here with half the strength. And then I added half the strength to this higher harmonic. This higher harmonic is musically called one-fifth higher, um, which the way we got it is we multiplied it by three, and then we divided it by two to drop it down one octave. Okay? So with that, let's listen to one-fifth. I don't think I have to highlight it. I think I can just type in a fifth here. You yeah, see, that's got the uh, A, and then it's got a higher harmonic. It still sounds a little bit like a little softer. Yes, it still sounds a little bit like a machine, but uh, it's an interesting thing. And the waveform, this is the, exactly the wave that you get by adding this one together with this one, which I can plot these two graphs and sum them together. You saw, right, you could, you could do it by hand, do it with an Excel, plot points with a calculator to get a better feel. The software is doing it a little bit faster for us. I've got these things where I've got pet 12, pet 5th. In fact, let me um, turn this off for a second and go back to the board. Uh, where is the... Oh, I'll, I'll help, I'll help. Or you can turn it over there too. <laughs> that, that, that's one way to do it. It's kind of a low-tech way. So, um, for some weird reason, um, if you want to stick tones in octaves, um, you can go from one, and then you can go, and so here let's do this in frequency. Can you write a uh, much bigger or, to, or a little yes. bit? And so we can let nu zero equal the fundamental frequency. And by fundamental frequency, you So that depends on what instrument you're having. If you've got a mono string and you just pluck the string in the middle, the one big wave will be the fundamental frequency of that instrument. Um, we can call it our 440A here for this particular instrument. Um, then we can have some other nice sounds. Um, so, uh, are going to be two times. Uh, and mu zero, a half times mu zero, four times mu zero, and these are different octaves. We could have a three times mu <coughs> zero, which three times mu zero doesn't fit in this octave, so the natural thing to do is to put a three halves times mu zero. This was kind of the next note that we hadn't covered by just using twos, which we're giving this octaves. And this, for some reason, is called the fifth, which we'll see why it's called the fifth here in a moment. What would the next new frequency be? The next new interval that you would consider. So you're getting all twos you get in, all threes, when we have this line of fractions, what's the next fraction or the next integer that we don't have when we multiply by five? Be five. And so you want to see your five mu naught. But now we want to bring this back into the octave between mu zero and two mu zero by five multiplying four. and dividing. So five fourths and divide by two once, it's still too big, divide by two twice. So five fourths of new knot, and this is called the third. 
<laughs> it seems backwards, I agree. Um, in fact, this is major. Major. So, in fact, what you can do, just putting those together, is the following. Um, you can start with some note, typically F, but it doesn't have to be this. And then you can go up a third. And you get a new note. You can also go up a major fifth and get another note. And this sounds really nice when you put it together. I happen to have a piano that I might display over here later, but let's see if we can listen to it. Um, turn up the volume a little bit. So let's see, I think Oh, what's happening here? Oh, you know what? I bet it too. Ooh, we yeah. all. Ah, there we got it. So, let's see. So, that's the one note. Now, here's when I... Oh, let's go up to the fifth. That's the fifth. That kind of sounds... That sounds better than the... Um, uh, math program because it's putting higher harmonics into the note. That's not just a pure sine wave tone. It sounds a little bit like a machine. But it's some combination of signs with some amplitudes in front of each. This one is the same one, but you just put, um, you just raise the frequency up on all of them by a factor of three halves. This one is you go up by five fourths, and when you put them together, you get a pretty nice sound. And so, in fact, well, if that's kind of nice, let's put it together and do it again. And so if you do it again, I can start from here and go up another, um, I'll leave off the majors, another third, and then I can do another fifth. And so that gives me a couple more notes. Then I can do it one more time. Um, another third, and another fifth. And in fact, then we can get back to the octave. So if you do this, you'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different notes, which you could, for instance, call A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You could. In fact, yeah. this is what musicians do. This is very traditional. So this is giving you seven notes. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay. There are actually some problem is in here that I'll try to explain with this idea where it's going to make people tweak things a little bit. It's going to explain, hopefully as we continue, you're going to see why a piano keyboard looks the way a piano keyboard looks as we continue. We'll get up and do more motions and do more things and put some more math. Are there questions about how this is fitting together? Yes? I don't understand how you got the fifth note as being three not divided by two. Right. So I need to answer this question. And so this I will answer a little okay. bit. So, okay. you know. We're going to need to take a look at a <laughs> piano keyboard in order to understand that because that doesn't seem to make any sense relative to these numbers here. And this confused me for a little while, I must say. Um, so we'll get there. Um, so let me do a couple things. Did any of you see Brandy's lecture on slide rules? Mm -hmm. 
I can tie this together a little bit, actually. And so one of the things that Brandy probably did is said, imagine that you are um, looking at multiplication and you want to make multiplication look like addition to make it easier to do and work with. So somehow we have a scale where there are these really natural things to identify where you've got a 1, then you come off with a 2, then you come off should I do it with ones and halves, or should I do it? Yeah, I can do it out then. If that's a two, I double it, that's a four, take this, double that, I would get out to an eight, etc. Somehow on the keyboard, when you have octaves, you don't have a C, a C, the next C even further, and the next C even further out. You scale them all so that they fit at the same widths. Right? And so this thing gets mapped to something where I would have a one, a two, uh, four, an eight. looking all the same distance instead of making this get even bigger than, right? So it's going to turn into even steps coming out. Um, and a half would be over here, which might look really funky to have that distance be the same as this distance, etc. This is what you do. So somehow we're trying to do some mapping. One of the things that we've done is we've subdivided the octave. And in this model, which is called Pythagorean tuning, we put a 3 halves somewhere in here. We put a 5 fourths somewhere over here. We can stick other things. The pattern here is that rational numbers with low denominators sound nice. Or rational numbers, if you're looking in wavelength language, rational numbers with low numerators when you're looking in the frequency domain sound nice, is what Pythagorean, was what Pythagoras discovered. One of the things that you'd like to do is anytime you have some note, you'd like to be able to go that interval above it. And so if I can start at this note and go up a fifth, I should then be able to go up a fifth again, and a fifth again, and a fifth again, and I should be able to go up a third, and it should all sound nice. So let's try this with, let's imagine that we start out with some note. So let's start out with so let's start out with our fundamental frequency. And then let's go up two octaves. And let's go down two octaves. And so let's go to one fourth of new naught. So this is down. Those should certainly sound nice together. Now let's go up a fifth. So when I go up by a fifth, what am I doing here? You went down by a fourth and then up by a fifth. Yeah, well, so when I say a fifth, this is the musical term of fifth, which is this one here. Oh, okay. Oh. You went down by a fifth or went up? Uh, up a fifth. So up a fifth. So when you go up, so going from here to here, this is called a fifth. So if I want to do a fifth from here, what would the frequency be? Three halves? It'd be three halves. Plus a fourth. 
Is it plus, or how are we combining these? I don't know. I don't know. Is it time? Ah, well, look here at the pattern when we oh, go up so octaves. And so to do an octave to a fourth, I get to an eight because it's two right. times two. And so the point is, this is a geometric series. It's constructed by multiplying numbers together. It's not an arithmetic sequence where you're adding numbers together. And somehow we're trying to map it at some level to something that is an arithmetic series. And there's going to be a little of a mismatch. It's going to kind of line up like a slide rule a little bit. But if I go up a fifth, then I'm going to get a three halves times one fourth times new naught. And then I can do up a fifth again. And I can do this four times. So that will be one fourth times three halves squared times new naught. And I can get to a one fourth times a three halves to the fourth times new naught. All of these should sound nice, right? Because it's just. Uh, you know, on the piano, uh, we are just, um, maybe that may, you know, we're starting with this one. Then we go down to this one. Then we go down to this one. Then we go up a fifth. Then up another fifth. Then up another fifth. Up another fifth. All right, that's what we've done so far. And then we can go down, and let's go down by a third. So when you go up a third, what would I do? Multiply by five fourths. And so to go down by a third, what would I do? Divide by four fifths. Or multiply by four fifths. Multiply by four fifths. So let's go down um, by a third. All right. So when we do that, what we get to is a fourth times a three halves to the fourth times a four fifths times new naught. So let's simplify this fraction. What is three to the fourth? Three halves. Well, it's four. I'm going to go three out to the fourth okay. is three to the fourth and two. So I get 81 because it's nine times nine. And then I get a 16. And, and what so is a 16 four. times five? Uh, oh, this four and this four counts. Oh, I missed that. Okay. Or I didn't see. 16 times five is 80. Uh huh. Times new naught. So this is 81 over 80 times new naught. That sounds fairly close to one, but not exactly one. Let's take a listen to that, just to hear what it sounds like. Um, <coughs> let's see. I guess I can erase the frequency steps here. So, I'll open another file here to show you. Uh, this thing is called the syntonic comma. If you start with Pythagorean's idea of making music, um, you get some nice things, but you also get some oddities. And this is one of the first oddities you get. And you notice that I am taking the 440, and I'm dividing it by... Um, why am I not? How did I get this? So, let's do the arithmetic here because I might have put the wrong arithmetic in. Um, so, we'll take the 440. 
and multiply it by 81 and divide it by 80. So that's going to go out with that. I can take a 4 and get an 11 over 2 times 81, um, which if I want, I could change the octave, but maybe let's even leave that in. 11 over 2 is 5.5 5 times 81. In other words, did I screw up the arithmetic anywhere? No. So I screwed up the arithmetic here because that's um, not a 5.5. 5. Now it's a 5.5. Okay? At 10.30 there's a... Uh, ah, yeah. are we at the 10.30? Is it? Yes, 10.30. Ah, so let me do this and then we can pause. <laughs> slightly irritating, yes. And so we want to figure out how to fix that slight irritation. That did not sound nice. Let me play it again. And one thing I want you to listen to is instead of just a straight bum, it's got the uh. Those are called beats where the tones don't exactly match. Um, so. down a little bit, which tuners listen for beats and try to find things that fit very close together. And if it sounds just in the perfect octave or if it sounds just perfect, uh, if they're matched up, they won't have those beats. Hmm. So I agree. This is a good place for a break. Let's have a break and we'll fix this problem with the beats and design a piano keyboard.